The Tronikin had been cutting a path of destruction through several different species' territory for well over 300 of their cycles. In human terms, that would be about 400 years. Humanity itself had not joined the war until much later, as they were very new to spacefaring, but they seemed to show a completely different understanding of warfare. Warfare that the Tyrannican were not ready for. The Nashiri were almost at the edge of collapse. A very peaceful and, for lack of a better term, primitive species that insisted on not damaging any planet they landed on any more than they absolutely had to. Though a very interesting species for the humans as they were both very similar to look at, even though the Nashani were much, much taller, however, much, much thinner, and also much more frail. The Tarankin were a little short compared to the humans, yet were able to bring up a very high amount of power every time they struck. This meant that going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the two, the Tarankin would outlast the Natiri very, very easily. In fact, it was well noted that Tarankin could actually take a kick to the head from their opponents and just stand there while they just listened to the leg break. This allowed them to go into other territories as well, and eventually those species reached out for the humans. And as the Union created itself around the humans' force, they began to take territory back from Tarankin. The Tarankin fought as best as they could, however, their way of dealing with things simply was a top-down structure. Everything came down from their emperor. It never went anywhere without his say-so, and because of that, they were late on any type of response to an invasion. If the humans were able to block communications, the Tarankin would not even fight unless given orders directly by those in command. And those in command of the planet wouldn't give any sort of order until they got word from the Emperor themselves. The Emperor, if they didn't know the battle was going on, simply couldn't give the order. And it was that simple. However, the Tarankin, being warriors at heart, fought against the forces of humanity and their new allies tooth and nail on many a world, not caring whether or not they got the orders or not. However, humanity had brought new weapons, weapons they thought were primitive. However, these projectile weapons proved more than effective, as most everyone's armor was designed specifically for energy-based weapons which meant that projectiles would punch through as if they weren't wearing any type of armor at all. Along with that, they found out that the humans were almost completely immune to energy weapons, though it would leave a burn and a very nasty smell in the air. Most of the humans would simply curse, scream, shake a little bit, and then continue forward. The Tarankin couldn't figure out how this was possible until later they saw that the burns created were that what the humans call third degree. These were usually covered in pustules, leaking different types of fluid, and immediately treated by one of their medical staff. All in all, the Tarankin just did not have a chance of winning against the humans, and they knew it. Many units, when they realized they could not stop a human advance, they simply surrendered. Many times, the one in charge would simply lay down next to their sword, waiting for the human to pick it up and drive it into their skull, which was their own tradition. They did not want to surrender, but this was a way of assuring that their own people would survive. Humanity never did this. They simply acknowledged the surrender and then started taking care of everyone. And this also turned more of the tide of battle away from the leadership of the Tarankin. The Tarankin eventually turned against their own leadership and began to join the humans. And now, now there is only one more place to take before the home planet of the Tarankin. If they are able to take this fortress world, the Tarankin will surrender, as they will have no chance of defeating humanity. The Tarankin Emperor himself 
along with the Empress, were inside this fortress world, buried deep within it. So deep, in fact, that even humanity's strongest weapons would not be able to take them out without cracking the entire planet. And they couldn't even fire that, as this fortress world was designed specifically to stop massive invasions. They couldn't get their carriers close, they would be tore apart. Their battleships would exchange fire and barely be able to touch the Tarankin defenses on the surface. Even the destroyers, as agile as they were, were barely able to make any headway. It was decided that those Tarankin, along with the humans, would make one last push. Inside, the Tarankin held a whole bunch of civilians, which made the humans hesitate. Not only were civilians of their own kind, but a whole bunch of prisoners, numbering in the tens of millions, brought there to work and to be used for their services. It was something that made the humans more and more agitated. The more they thought about this, and they wanted a piece of the action. Many of the human drop soldiers were told that they wouldn't be able to get through the ground fire. And they always said the same thing. I don't fucking care. Just send me. Most of the time, this was met with most of those looking on at the humans like they were completely and totally insane. Did they have a death wish or something? We all knew that the medical technology of the humans was able to recover them from pretty much anything. Hell, in some cases, all they found was a head and most of the spine along with a neck, and they were able to reconstitute the rest of the body, and the human itself, within the matter of three months, was able to move around again, though atrophy is still a pain in the ass. He was able to move around and immediately get himself back on his feet. By now, he is with the 14th Infantry waiting for their chance to go into the surface and end this battle once and for all. With their Tronken allies, they developed a plan. They would punch a hole in one of the outer defenses, land their soldiers, and they would continue on. And this would be the first true time that humanity and the Tronken would be working side by side. A show of peace for what was to come. The Tarankin did not care for the ones inside, as they were, by translation to the humans, the elite guard. The elite guard were known for their cruelty, their absolute debauchery, and treating everyone like excrement. The humans didn't need a translation for that one. They were even more interested in getting down now, as one of them said, so their SS. Good. Every one of the humans had a strange look on their face at that point. They showed that predatory smile they had as they started thinking about it and confirming with each other. The Tronkin were more purists than anything else, as they didn't want to mix in with the other species, yet they would use them for their own personal enjoyment. They would never actually intermix that much, if at all. In fact, if you went too much against the standard of Tarankin, you were executed publicly. No one wanted that. They were done dealing with the Emperor and their bullshit. So the plan went off. In one day, every single dreadnought, followed by every battleship, cruiser, destroyer, and frigate, fired on one small section of a hemisphere. Within a matter of two hours, they had completely flattened over 300 kilometers in radius in one area. Even though they took a lot of casualties from ground fire along with the satellites and any fighters they managed to send up, they were still able to get their opening. And because they had their opening, the drop soldiers got ready. The Tarankin that were ready to go preferred the shuttles as they hated the drop pods. They weren't designed for their physiology. The drop pods were very violent, and the humanity soldiers simply looked at it as though it was a fun carnival ride. Many of the Tarankin watched as the drop pods were launched, looking through the very, very tiny window as a human would once again smile 
right before they were yoinked out the bottom of the ship. With that, the shuttles followed them down with a brisk pace. The Tarankins started to wonder if the pilots of the shuttles were just as insane as the drop troopers considering how fast they were going to go in. They wondered if they would actually reach the surface or if they burn up on the way through, through all the weapons fire, all the explosions. All of the shuttles started to dodge, dip, dive, duck, and dodge all over the place, making sure they could dodge any type of fire that was coming in, constantly moving so that no one could get a lock on them. All sorts of decoys and chaff and everything was going down, making it impossible to figure out where in the hell you were going. Most of the pilots had their eyes locked on their sensor arrays as they could barely see outside their windows. The Tarankin elite guard had made sure to make the atmosphere almost unattainable, especially for landfall. Once inside the planet, of course, there were filters to make sure that the toxic atmosphere would not seep in. But for right now, they were using it as their advantage to stop any sort of visuals from happening. Many of the pilots cursed as they could only see maybe a half a kilometer, if they were lucky, a full kilometer out, and then locked their eyes back on their sensor arrays. When they got down, many of the Tarankans immediately left the shuttles and vomited all over the ground, having to pull up their masks just so they could relieve the contents of their stomach. With that, many human pilots laughed hysterically as they lifted off, closing the doors as they went, and then launching themselves back into space. Right behind them were the other shuttles bringing down more of their heavy ordnance, and the 1st Armored Division. The 1st Armored would be the tip of the spear, at least they believe so. In this sort of mixed warfare, being a fortress world, a lot of it is going to be house to house, street to street fighting, as the entire planet was covered with all different kill zones. It was set up in all sorts of hexagonal shapes so that there was always a high ground to be had. Humanity's ships again made another barrage and lengthened the amount of space they had. Those on the ground were barely able to stay on their feet. Due to every single one of the large projectiles screeching through the atmosphere and landing with the same force as an atomic weapon, the sudden burst of air that came out was something that the Tronkin were not ready for. Yet the humans would look down at the Tronkins holding on to the strange dirt and go, Can't fight from down there, boy, and simply kick them slightly, trying to get the Tronkin back on their feet. Before the Tronkin even realized what was going on, the humans had begun their advance. They were heading straight towards the Emperor. They knew where they'd be. The Emperor was going to be in the most defended area, the castle. The castle stood tall and proud, walls layered upon layered upon layered. Several distortion fields were set up to make it almost impossible to lock onto a target. You would have to dummy fire in if you tried to get there. Along with that, so many weapons were pointed to the sky specifically to stop ordnance from coming in, along with fighters and ships and anything else, that you would realize why no one was able to fire on it. Around each side, each point of the hexagon was a anti-dreadnought weapon using the gravitational field of the planet itself to charge it. One of these would slice right through even the humans' fleets, and they knew it too. So this would be down and dirty on the ground as they realized they would not have any air support. The fighters just couldn't get in, and they would be torn to ribbons. The only area they were able to even land was that one spot that was very slowly being opened up by space-based artillery fire. And yet, they continued. The armor continued to push as best as they could, but the trunk and elite guard had their own type of armor. And they were ready. They had planned for this for years. Getting this one space rock ready to be defended at all costs, as this was their final holdout. Eventually, humanity's forces were able to fight their way tooth and nail, many of them missing arms and legs by the time they even got towards the castle, but never stopping. 
And as they finally cracked that nut, they realized that there was a single tank that was able to somehow keep the rest of theirs at bay. They couldn't quite get an angle on it, though they tried. Many of them eventually had to fire all sorts of smoke, something the Tronken had never even thought of using, to conceal the movement of several of their tanks up to finally take those out. And now they were within range of the castle itself. Though the weapons were pointed to the sky to stop fleets, they never thought that anyone would make it down to the planet. So, the based weapons on the ground were not nearly as strong or nearly as numerous. And with that, the tanks, the artillery, and everything else began to open up on the castle, breaking down the walls in the matter of two hours. There was a giant hole and every single one of the guns was aimed at that and fired a massive volley into it. And as the side of it slid down and crushed on the ground, crushing many of their own people, there was a signal that came up. It was a signal of surrender. That not only made the humans cheer, but the Tronken as well, as they had now achieved something they didn't think was possible. They were free from the Emperor. But now, what do they do? How are they going to live? How are they going to survive? Many of their forces, their fleet has been completely destroyed, except for the home fleet. And that's barely going to be enough to scratch the surface. There's so many civilians that need to be taken care of, yet 90% of all the males had been forced into the military once the war kicked off in earnest. How are they going to be able to keep things going? All the humans simply told them, Don't worry about it. We've done this before. We got you covered. And with that, they were surprised to see that humanity, even though deposing the Emperor and forcing them to surrender and making sure that they would never be able to gain any type of foothold again, the Tronken were actually surprised at the care the human shown. Not only as the prisoners were freed, but also to the Tronken elite guard. Well, with the exception of a few. One of the humans walked up and recognized one of the commanders, simply saying, You remember me, asshole? The Tronken looked surprised and kind of confused, as though the translator didn't work, yet the translator was right there next to his auditory nerve. Everyone knew it was functioning. I remember you. And without another moment's hesitation, he drew a sidearm, put it next to the Tronken's skull, squeezed the trigger, and a loud kabang was heard as brain matter sprayed across the subordinates. Many of his own men yelled at him as what he was doing, and he simply stated, that was a personal matter between me and him, nothing else, and then holstered his weapon, not even bothering to knock the entrails that were now all over the muzzle. With that, humanity had won the war. They had been able to come back from a species that had barely found their way into space, re-engineered ships from all the other races that joined with them, and built their own armada in such a short time the Trunken were absolutely astounded. How could they possibly keep up with a force like this? Later on, the Tronken were shown how humanity was not only the meanest motherfucker to ever enter the Valley of Death, but they were also an angel, as they brought many supplies to the home planet to make sure the population was not starving. They were able to fix much of the fortress world. Many of their original planets were brought back to habitation by what the humans call terraforming. The Trunken were amazed. Why, why would you do this? It was a very interesting but short video. As one of the Trunken shoulders that ended up fighting right next to the 14th Infantry asked another one of what they call an NCO. Why are you being so nice to us? I mean, we were your enemy, but I don't understand. 
the NCO simply looked and said, you fought with us, not just against us, but remember you fought with us? Yeah. And you remember what happened here? As he pointed into the trunken's arm, highlighting the small scar that was there as one of the energy blasts had taken off part of the muscle. And when they regrew it, there was an obvious scar. Yes, I, I remember that, he said with a bit of discomfort, trying not to remember the pain that came with it. Well, do you remember this? The soldier pulls up his shirt and shows several burn marks. Your people gave me these. Our people gave you that. Y yes, but I, it still doesn't make me understand why you can be so generous to someone who is your enemy, who tried to kill you. <laughs> well, that's simple. We were opponents during time of war. But now that we fought the last battle, the war is over. <laughs>